The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus said to his disciples, Take care that no one deceives you. Because many will come using my name and saying, I am the Christ, and they will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumours of wars. Do not be alarmed, for this is something that must happen, but the end will not be yet. For nation will fight against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes here and there. All this is only the beginning of the birth pangs. Then they will hand you over to be tortured and put to death, and you will be hated by all the nations on account of my name. And then many will fall away. Men will betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise. They will deceive many, and with the increase of lawlessness, love in most men will will grow cold. But the man who stands firm to the end will be saved." The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Ave Maria. Ave Maria. Well, as I mentioned earlier, today, as well as being the day with Mary, is the feast of the first martyrs of the Church of Rome. Not a particularly well known feast, but it follows on from yesterday's solemnity of St. Peter and St. Paul. And it means that we very much remain focused on the eternal city, Rome. We think of the many men, women and children who suffered in Rome in those early decades of the church, and especially under the emperor Nero in 64 AD. According to the Roman historian Tacitus, the Christians suffered unspeakable torments at that time. He said, covered with the skins of beasts, They were torn by dogs and perished, or were nailed to crosses, or were doomed to the flames and burnt to serve as nightly illuminations when daylight had expired. Nero offered his gardens for this spectacle and was exhibiting a show in the circus while he mingled with the people in the dress of a charioteer or stood aloft on a car. Hence, Even for criminals who deserved extreme punishment, there arose a feeling of compassion, for it was not, as it seemed, for the public good, but to glut one man's cruelty that they were being destroyed in this way. The witness of so many of these martyrs shows us just how quickly the Christian faith um, took root in the city of Rome after it it had been brought there by St. Peter and St. Paul. And if you've been to Rome, you'll know that it's full of memorials to these martyrs. I think of the churches of Santa Pudenziana and Santa Praxedes, not too far from the Basilica of Santa Maria Maggiore. These two churches are named after sisters who supposedly had a British mother, Claudia. And during this time of persecution, they went round the city burying the bodies of the martyrs and distributing goods to the poor and the persecuted. A picture in one of the churches shows the sisters collecting the blood of the martyrs in sponges and then squeezing it into jars so that they could be kept as holy relics. Perhaps more famously are the catacombs, and I'm sure if you've been on a pilgrimage to Rome, you've visited at least one of the catacombs on the outskirts of the city. Roman law prohibited burial within the city And so these vast complexes of tunnels and rooms were dug underground into the soft volcanic rock. They were used by pagans, by Jews, and by Christians alike. But the best-known catacombs are the ones 
used by the Christians in those early centuries. And when some of them were rediscovered in the 1500s, the bones that were found there were believed in many cases to be the relics of these early martyrs. And you can find them all over Rome and also all over the Christian world. In the catacomb of Priscilla, which is to the north of the center of Rome, you can also find one of the, one of the oldest known images of our Blessed Lady. It's a fresco dating back to at least the first half of the third century, although perhaps it's a bit earlier. And it shows the Virgin with the child Jesus on her knees in front of a prophet who is pointing to a star. It's a very significant picture because we have relatively few written records from the Roman church of this time. And it testifies to the central place of Our Lady for the early Roman Christians and for those persecuted martyrs. Although they may not have used the title, they must have looked to Mary as Queen of Martyrs. Mary did not lose her life in a violent, bloody way, as so many of those early Christians did. But in a sense, Mary was a martyr. They felt, the early Christians, that she had a solidarity with them. The word martyr, as you all know, means witness. And of course, in a very general sense, Our Lady was truly a witness to her son, perhaps her son's greatest witness. She carried him in her womb. She pondered, meditated on everything that she heard and saw. She watched Jesus grow up, begin his public ministry, work miracles, tell parables. And then she stood at the foot of the cross and she encountered the risen Christ and was filled with the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Mary was truly a witness in this general sense. But she was also a martyr in her suffering. As Simeon foretold, her heart was pierced by seven swords. She endured the flight into Egypt, the loss of the child Jesus in the temple, his rejection by his own people, and all the horrors of that first Good Friday. And she was not a passive spectator in all of this, but an active participant, suffering with her son, offering up his life, trusting in the mysterious ways of God, obeying his will. If you have a chance, have a look at the Stations of the Cross around our church, which are very, very vivid. And in most of them, you see Mary in the background, being with her son, suffering with her son, offering with her son. As St. Bernard observed, through her heart's compassion, she far surpassed the physical passion of the martyrs. Mary was martyred emotionally and spiritually by being there on Good Friday. So the first martyrs of the Church of Rome, who we remember today, no doubt had recourse to the intercession of Mary, who herself experienced a martyrdom. And so have generations of martyrs ever since. Just a few days ago, we celebrated the feast of St. John Southworth, who is in very many ways the great martyr of this diocese of Westminster. You can find his body in Westminster Cathedral. He was a priest put to death in 1654, in the days of Oliver Cromwell. And it seems that the judge was reluctant to condemn him to death. He tried his best to help him. But the problem was that St. John Southworth refused to deny that he was a priest. In fact, he took great joy in saying publicly, I am a Catholic priest. And of course, if you admitted that, the judges felt their hands were tied in terms of the law, because if you were a priest without having done anything else, that was a capital offense, and you could be sent to the gallows. And so he was executed in June 1654. And in a very particular way, he's become a patron of priests in this diocese. And we must remember that today, as we speak in Westminster Cathedral, a number of men are being ordained to the priesthood, and they'll be prostrating themselves during the Litany of the Saints around the shrine of that martyr, John Southworth. 
But sadly, martyrdom is not just a thing of the past. We live in a church of martyrs. Martyrdom is not a colourful historical memory, but a disturbing present reality. Did you know that in the year 2017, last year, 3,066 Christians were killed because of their faith? 3,066 Christians were martyred. That's an average of 322 every month. In our seemingly enlightened, liberal, free world, one out of every three people live in a country without religious freedom. Of course, in many ways, all of us sitting here are more fortunate. We no longer face a bloody martyrdom. None of us are going to be dragged along Oxford Street to be hanged, drawn and quartered. Priests, thank God, don't have to jump into hiding holes at a moment's notice. Those days are past. But of course, we're not immune from challenges in our own day. We all know, for one thing, that the path of the Christian is the way of the cross. Whether or not we live in a time of freedom or persecution, we can't avoid suffering. We can't avoid, if you like, our own personal martyrdom. God offers no quick fixes. He works and acts in terms of eternity. Faith does not necessarily bring us prosperity or good health or ease of life. Even the mother of God, who always leads the way, had to endure untold sorrows. The Christian writer Catherine de Huc Doherty had to endure persecution from the Soviets, and she experienced great temptations to her faith and her hope. And yet, as she wrote, she found solace in Mary. She said, You go to the woman who stood beneath the cross and loved the enemies of her son. You go to her and say, Mother, I feel lost. I'm afraid. I'm tasting a loneliness beyond any loneliness, beyond any loneliness that I imagined was possible. For your son has left me, or so it seems to me. In this time of trial, hold me tight. Hold me tight because you alone can find him. Lead me to him. You know the way. For wherever he is, there I want to be. People in time of despair and persecution find Mary a guiding light and a strength and a comfort. Mary is indeed the queen of martyrs because she has, has herself experienced martyrdom. She knows all about fear and despair and grief. Of course, in terms of faith, we also face all sorts of trials. Daily indifference, for example, from our relatives, our friends, our neighbours. People simply don't get what we do in church each Sunday. I'm sure many of your friends don't really understand why you're here at this day with Mary. They don't really understand why we try to live our faith every day of our lives. The life of faith can seem irrelevant and inaccessible, almost some sort of parallel universe. And we watch our children, our relatives, our friends, our colleagues, lapse, and that can be so heartbreaking, as we all know. And sometimes we experience hostility and aggression itself. For expressing beliefs that are different from the norm, we are quickly accused of bigotry. Laws are passed, even in this Western world, that limit, at least indirectly, our religious freedom and chip away at some of our key values. Like Mary, we face a spiritual and emotional martyrdom day by day. Mary herself experienced the indifference and hostility shown to her beloved son. And because it was shown to her beloved son, it was also directed at her. Let us ask for her maternal intercession so that we show others the joy and the freedom that faith alone gives, so that we are slow to judge others or get angry, especially when we're challenged, that we stand firm and carry our cross and be loyal to our faith, and that by doing so, we bear witness to the Lord and just like Mary, 
lead others to him. Mary, Queen of Martyrs, pray for us. Ave Maria. Ave Maria.